event of what we're calling Sarah Talks, where we get a bunch of women in the community who talk about their work and, the, and their activism and their achievements. So today is my pleasure to start with the Women Chefs of Oxford, and I'm turning it over to our operations coordinator, Kevin Cozart, who's going to facilitate the conversation. So, so thank you. Thank you. Um, we do really mean for it to be a conversation. I know. I think all the panelists are a little nervous about being in front of people, so uh, think of it as a conversation and we'll go with there. Uh, today we have with us uh, Just or Brazel? Brazel. Brazel. Um, or AKA Mama Jo. Um, <laughs> we have Carla Rego, uh, who runs Lusa's, and uh, Dixie Grimes with the Dixie Bell Cafe at the BTC Old Fashioned Grocery. So I think you get the longest name award. So, um, so to start with, um, I'd like you to kind of introduce yourself and Dixie, if you don't mind starting for us, uh, kind of introduce yourself and talk about how you started cooking. You know, uh, who taught you that kind of thing? So okay, uh, well I'm Dixie Grimes. I'm born and raised uh, in Oxford, and I now live in Water Valley. And like most Southern female chefs, I learned to cook from my grandmother. I was raised by my grandmother, and from the time I was old enough to walk, I was always in the kitchen with her. Um, I think most of the time she just gave me a chore to keep me out of the way, like rolling the dumplings. Um, but pretty much everything I do now as a chef, I have a fine dining background, but at the core of that, I'm totally just a Mississippi girl. Um, and so I'm all about Southern cooking. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I'm Joessa Sabraza. It's known as Mama Joe's. Uh, I started uh, cooking back when I was about five years old. Uh, now I guess you would could say it did uh, come from my uh, parents, my mom. Uh, I used to see her in the kitchen all the time, but I started outside with with. Uh, mud and grass and the little pea thing that growed on the thing on the on the trees out there. I would make up all that stuff. She was cooking in the kitchen. I was outside cooking. <laughs> I, I made my mud cakes, my cookies. I made all of them out there and put them in the sun, let the sun cook them. And I boiled my greens and it was grass. And and you know, I sort of started like that, and I think that my cooking actually didn't come from my, just come from my parents. I think my cooking is a gift from God because my recipe, some of my, some of my recipe just didn't come from my parents, but it was like written on the wall and I picked it up, uh, you know, wake up through the night and they was there and I would write them down and I start, and that's the way my ground, background started. But my mom was a cook for the public school and she worked there for years and years and years. But my first cooking experience was when I was about five and a half years old. Uh, I had I cooked out of a dinner. My mom was, and dad were going fishing. So I made some fried chicken, some turnip green, some pinto beans, and some sweet potato yam, and made my first camel cake from stretch. And I was five and a half years old. So, <laughs> I thought that was awesome. So from that day, <laughs> so from that day, my parents started me to me to cooking in the kitchen because I did that dinner and they was fishing and when they come home, all they had to do is to eat. So that's how I got started to cook. That is incredible. You fried the chicken. And <laughs> hey, I got to follow up on that one though. Did you also have to clean the chicken? Before you could fry? No, no, okay. no, 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 no. They had bought chicken. Okay. <laughs> no, so. I didn't. I didn't kill no chicken. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I asked my mother it talks about you know growing up and having you know they had a chicken coop and having to clean their own you know kind of kill and clean their own chickens and that kind of stuff. Oh, so uh -huh. I'm just wondering. So. Well, um, I didn't learn when I was five, <laughs> but actually. First of all, I'm from Portugal. My parents are not cooks at all. My, my father is a teacher, my mother was a nurse midwife, but um, I'm an only child. And my parents, when I was 10, they thought that if something happens to them, I have to be by myself 
and take care of me. So one day when I was 10 years old, my father said, it's time for you to start cooking. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that you are going to cook is boiled potatoes and fish and cabbage because it's a very traditional dish in Portugal. And I went to the kitchen and he said, well, the potatoes are here, the fish is here. Actually, it was salted cod uh, that was already with, in water for two days. I don't know if you know or not, but the salted cod cannot be cooked right away. It needs to be like in water at least two, three days to be edible. And the cabbage is there, so the, the kitchen is all yours. So I made the, my, my first potatoes and they were awful. <laughs> I put too much salt. <laughs> And we went to the table and my father said, well, you know what? It's not so bad, Carla. Tomorrow, you are going to be here doing the same dish. So I did the same dish 12 times <laughs> before it was edible. And uh, after the, those 12 days, my father said, you know, we can go for the next dish. You are going to learn how to cook rice. So after that, you know, I didn't stop learning how to cook. I, I, I didn't learn with anyone. I just, I'm the, I think I'm like you guys. I just, sometimes people ask me for recipes and I eyeball everything. Yes. Uh, I just, I give the recipe and then the customer said, you know, it's not the same recipe. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I yeah. swear to God it is. And he said, I gave you the right recipe. No, no, it's not the same. You, you do this different way. And my husband is like, you eyeball everything. Do you tell her? He said, yeah, I told her that. Put, just put a little bit of salt, a little <laughs> bit of pepper. <laughs> I guess that's why I'm never going to write a book because I don't have, I don't have patience to do that. But uh, I don't, and my background is computer science. So I'm not, you know, I just grew up as a cook, cooking at home for my parents and then uh, for myself. And I guess I'm with a bakery now. <laughs> but I didn't learn from any school. You know, it's just like I learn a little bit every day. So I, I, I kind of taught myself how to cook. So. That, the, one of your memories, you know, my mother drives her sisters crazy because they'll come for holiday and my mother will have made something. They'll ask for the recipe and she say, well, a bit of this and a dash of that and, you know, that kind of stuff. And then they're like, this is not a recipe. Well, it is to her, you know, so. Um, so this kind of gives us a good transition. Um, can you talk about how you transition to kind of cooking for personal reasons uh, to cooking as a career, to kind of, as it being kind of your job kind of thing? So, well, you, know, you said you were in computer science, so how did yes, you go from computer actually, science to bakery? <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I was a teacher first. And um, I taught in Portugal, I married, and I came to the United States. And my husband was teaching here at Omis. So I ended up one year later to work at IT here at PowerSol. Mm -hmm. And I worked here for like three or four years, I don't remember anymore, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> uh, and, and I really liked what I was doing, but uh, I thought I had this brilliant idea that I should open a bakery. Because <laughs> I thought, and my husband thought also that I was an excellent cook. Oh, no, no, you're going to be great. <laughs> so it just, I, I resigned from IT and uh, I just ended up, you know, like waiting one year to find a place here in Oxford to open a bakery. It was seven years ago. We were during the recession, you know. So things were not really very well, and, and my mother was like, are you sure? <laughs> because it's different <laughs> from working in a bakery and a restaurant and cooking at home. You know, it's just like, it's a large quantity. <laughs> and, I, and I actually learned a lot in the first three months because everything that I put outside in five minutes was gone. And I, I had one person that worked with me, can you put more stuff outside? He said, no, I need to make it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any notion about the quantities because I didn't know how many people were coming. You know, so I learned a lot. You learn, you know, <laughs> I taught myself again. So uh, that's how I ended up uh, having the bakery. 
and stuck in business? Well, I started off about, uh, I first tried to be a nurse. I didn't run so self in that. I couldn't stand being in the operating room. I passed out. <laughs> <laughs> so then the next test, I tried to do hair. I couldn't do that long. I did it for some years, but I couldn't do that long. So then I, I was cooking at home, and my husband loved it, my cooking. All the children loved my cooking. So everybody liked it, my cooking. So I said, well, maybe I could do that. So I worked for the AO Pie and the Kappa Alpha, mm -hmm. and I was preparing their meals and making their recipes and things, and I was doing all that there. So one day I decided, I said, well, hey, I should make this my career. So I made it up in my mind that I was going to try out myself, you know, get me a building and open up for me and try it myself. And uh, that's how I began to go out on my own. And at first it was sort of hard trying to get it established. But uh, as time passed and I came out here to the campus and I went to classes and they, sh to business management, and they put me mm -hmm. on the track of how to do a business <coughs> and what to look for and what to not to look for, what to build up and what not to build up. And uh, after that, I began to, um, Go to Oma Mama Joe's here out, out, out seven, and uh, from there I started cooking little meals that God had gave me in a vision. And my sister-in-law, which is Judy, she, uh, she came on board with us, and so it was for years and years. It was just her and I, and and we got together and we put our head together and. When we got together and did things, things happened. Happen. People started liking our food, and we started doing the fried cornbread that lots of people call yeah. cupcakes. Uh, <laughs> cakes. They gave them all different names, but of course, my, uh, my sister-in-law, she didn't like that, so if you don't tell me the right name for this cornbread, you're not going to get it. So you got to have the right name for the cornbread. But um, what really got us started and kicking off and got the business flow is when Andrew Zinneman came to there, came there, and when he came and he ate all the all the chicken bones and the neck bone bones and the pig feet bones, <laughs> and you know he was letting the, the the Oxford community know that this one Mama Joe's one bizarre food. But he ate the bones, and he made it reside through the bones. So that's what he did. And you know how when he came in, and then it got published, and we came out on television. Then our it, it, it business just floated. It just it just floated from that day to this day. It just floated, and so that's how we got started. What year did you open? I opened up in two thousand and four. Out of, out of the place where I am now. Yes, ma'am. And so I think that's how Mama Joe's really got started out. Well, I kind of had a rough start into my young adult life. I didn't really have a um, career path. I was raised by my grandparents, and my grandparents passed away. And I left home around 16, and I was pretty much on my own, kind of floating out around in the world trying to figure out what my purpose was, <laughs> where I was supposed to be. But most importantly on my list was survival. And, you know, not really having any skills and being so young, the one thing that I thought I might could do was cook to make a living. Everybody that I cooked for at home always said, oh, you're, you're a really good cook. I really like that. Um, and I got lucky enough, the Downtown Grill opened on the Oxford Square, which at the time was Oxford's first and only fine dining restaurant. Um, and I got lucky enough to get hired there uh, when I was around 18 as a prep cook, which in a restaurant is the lowest person on the totem pole. You are the grunt, you were there for the service of all the chefs, whoever may need anything at any time. Um, it was a 40 hour week job and it was steady. And so I absolutely took it. And then, unbeknownst to me, and at a very young age, within two years of just hard work, I had worked my way up the ladder and I had become 
the executive chef of this restaurant with no formal training at all, just a knowledge and an innate and passion for cooking. Um, but I still honestly wasn't sure that that was my career path. Um, I would say I was probably, I was there for almost 13 years, but I would say that I was about 30 years old before I finally 100% gave in to the restaurant business um, and realized that I could make a really good living at it and that I was really good at it and it was something that brought me joy on most days. Um, I'm a firm believer I think life is entirely too short to do something for a living that does not bring you joy. It should be, not be about the money. It should be about your happiness. And um, I actually, I worked at another restaurant in Oxford for a little while, uh, for almost seven years, called 208, that's no longer there. And then I left and I went to Texas for two years. Houston, Texas. It's a very big city. Um, and it was not kind to me. It was just not the right place for me. And so I was realized I needed to come back to Mississippi. Um, and. I happened to, I knew Jamie who lived in Water Valley. It happened to be football season and I thought, you know, I stopped in Water Valley as a layover. I was trying to make it through football season to go back into the restaurant business because it is so crazy in Oxford during football season. Um, I was trying to assimilate back into Mississippi life from coming from Houston. Um, but I didn't want to just be there and not have a job. The BTC had just opened, had not been there very long. Um, and my, who is now my business partner, has no cooking experience at all, has no restaurant experience, but saw a need in Water Valley for breakfast. Nobody really does breakfast. Um, so as luck would have it, I walked in. She hired me on the spot. She did not even know my last name for a good solid <laughs> week. Um, and my intention was never to stay there. It was always to come back to Oxford, but something about Water Valley it reminded me of my childhood. There was a simplicity there and a way of life that I found that I could, one, I could see my customers face to face a lot like these two ladies do. You know, I see my customers on a regular basis. They come into my kitchen. People come in and ask me all kinds of crazy things during any time of the day. And, you know, and it's fun. It, it, I enjoy it. Um, and so before I knew it, there I was in Water Valley. I was working at the BTC, I decided to stay, and again, as luck would have it, someone wrote an article in the New York Times about Water Valley. Actually, Erin Abbott, Dorothy's daughter, was part of this article, and they shouted out my food in probably the biggest way that it's ever been shouted out in my career. And from that came a cookbook deal, um, it also came a partnership with Alexi Van Buren, who is my co-owner in the BTC. And now I have my own restaurant that is part of the BTC, but I also have the freedom to cook anything that I want to cook on any given day and really get back to my roots. Um, I love fine dining. I love to go out to a nice meal, but quite frankly, if I'm in Oxford, Jamie will tell you, I want to go to Mama Joe's. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's where I want to go. Like, that's where my roots are, and I'm really trying to get back to that. Fine. I've got a quick follow-up question to that. Um, I kind of heard you talking about different things, but what is the one piece of advice you would give to a woman who was thinking about opening a restaurant? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> and then after you get that out, what's the next thing you tell them? Listen, don't if, do it if, again. If you're, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, if you're going to do it, you really need to be passionate about it, and it needs to bring something to your life. I guarantee you, if you ask these two ladies, they will tell you it brings something to their life on a daily basis. I know going into my kitchen every day brings something to my life. Um, you really need to be committed to it. If you are in the restaurant business because you think that you are going to be independently wealthy within five years, you have no idea how this, <laughs> like, they are giant money pits. Every bit of money you have will get sucked Stuck back out. into it. As <laughs> as you make it. That is long hours. Hey, you are working when everybody else is having fun. Holidays, Sweet. weekends, <laughs> nights. Yeah, you're not going to any football games, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so you really got to be all in and, and invested. You know, you, it has to be a passion for you. If you just want to make a quick buck, I would say don't do it. Mm -hmm. Anything y'all want to add? I know you talked about uh, using like the Small Business Development Center to kind of help y'all get up and run. So, 
same. Yeah. But, you know, just to add on to her, you got to want to cook. Mm -hmm. You got to be a person that love, love cooking. If you don't love cooking, being a cooking business person is the wrong place to be. Because it's a loss of time. And like she said, and no money. And no money. No money. <laughs> <laughs> overhead is rough. I mean, you know, overhead is overhead is is, is rough. Yes. You know, especially in Oxford. Mm -hmm. You have slow times and times that are crazy, like the games. Yes, the game season is is incredible, crazy. Yes. <laughs> and expect long, long, long um, hours. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I think that you don't even count at the end of the week how many hours you, you I saw, a, I think it was in a CNN, uh, a person saying, talking about how many hours you would work <laughs> during the week, and he was like, oh, I got a, it, I don't know about what was the program about, but I was in bed with my husband, and we were watching TV, and and the guy was saying, oh, I work like 90 hours per week. And I was like, hey, let's see how many hours I work. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this guy. <laughs> it's nothing. You work every day, every day. Even if you are closed, you need to work. Mm -hmm. Because you always have stuff to do. Yes. Always. And you go home, and your work goes with you. Mm -hmm. goes with you can't right. close the door and say no. You know, tomorrow, there's, there's no chance of that. So you actually are married with the business. Married with the business. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> but it's, it's OK. You get it. It's OK. OK, you get used to it. So I'm going to skip one of my questions. I'm going back to it because I do want to know it. But that kind of leads into this one. Um, is it hard to separate work from personal life? Do you get asked to cook during your downtime? For instance, if you're on vacation with family, do they expect you to cook? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yes. 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 You yes. can't get away from it even more, especially if you're with family. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Especially if you're with family. The assumption is you, of course, will be cooking. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Last, I think last time I went to Portugal was two years ago during Christmas time, and I cook every day. I cooked every day. They would call me, oh, what do you want to cook today? Because we are in the market. You want real? Do you want fish? And I was like, for my husband, I'm on vacation. <laughs> it's fine, Carla. <laughs> so after, after two weeks, three weeks in Portugal, I said, well, I'm going home for a vacation. <laughs> because that was not vacation at all. I cook almost all the meals. Oh, oh well. So it's not really, yeah. They expect you to yes. cook. Yes. <laughs> so, um. Yes. yes. Yeah, there, there is, you know, we go on vacation or go to see Jamie's family quite a bit, and they just frankly send me the menus of what I'm going to be cooking. <laughs> like, there's no question, there's no, do you want to do it? Um, her father will absolutely let me buy anything I want in the grocery store, but he has a set menu, and there is no varying from the menu at all. Um, and that's, a, you know, it really okay. is. It really is okay. I mean, sometimes it would be nice just to have an actual, like, vacation. Yeah. But <laughs> getting to go and do these things with your family and to feed yeah. them and see the joy on their face, like, yeah, you, you know you're bringing them some happiness, and it kind of yeah. makes but it... But still would be nice to have someone yeah. to cook for us yeah, <laughs> sometimes. And I've learned, Jamie has a huge family, and I've learned to utilize all those hands and chopping and dicing and, and whatnot and sneak away every now and then and come back. She Wait. comes in late Saturday morning, like, can't you cook in the morning? Come back. <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of the restaurant, I know. <laughs> well, my family look for me. They tricks me all the time. I always get tricked. Oh. So they say, well, you know, we're going to have dinner at your house today. 
uh, any holiday. We're going to have dinner at your house. Okay, what are we going to have? We, they makes out the menu and they're going to come and help. But at, at, the, at dinner time, time to eat, nobody never there. <laughs> The food there, but nobody there. So I'm cooking the night before, trying to get all this stuff cooked, and nobody never there. So they show up when everything on the table, table set up, lined up. That's when they show up. So they look for you to cook. Yeah. <laughs> we have to look for you to cook. So you is our mom. Our mom just don't tuck over the place. So therefore, we look for those Thanksgiving and Christmas and. Every day just about trying to find out see if you gonna cook when you get home. You know, so <laughs> I always ask Mom, do you gonna cook this evening when we get home? We she don't have to drive home. We gotta rest. <laughs> already done said what time we rest, so y'all take notes. Rest. <laughs> you rest on the way home. <laughs> um, so, going back, um, what is your favorite dish or meal to prepare, and is there a sentimental connection to it? Mine is chicken rotate. Yes. <laughs> That's one of my famous. That's one of the one that I got an off the wall mm. in a vision. Okay. Mine is my grandmother's fried chicken. Um, it is, I have not changed one thing about that. I make it exactly the way that she showed me how to make it. And she does some tricky stuff to it that quite frankly as a chef, I would have never thought about doing to it. But I, every time I serve that chicken, there's a big smile on my face because I know my grandmother's looking down and seeing her chicken Go out and all these other smiling faces eating that. So hands down, that's that's my favorite thing to make because it reminds me of her. I really, I really don't have any dish that I like to make more than the other. I, I like to cook. So just. Do you have some favorites that you, or comfort food type thing? Um, maybe <laughs> boiled potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> We actually, it's, uh, actually it's very good, very simple, very good. If you cook everything together, the flavors of the food kind of go and mix each other. And I guess it was the first dish that my father <laughs> taught me. But it's 